Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number 38A, titled Soldier Skills. Podcasts 34 through 61 are stories from the year of Army training I experienced. The training started in August 1966 and ended in June 1967. The stories are published in the book Reluctant Lieutenant from Basic to OCS in the 60s, which was published by Texas A&M University Press as a military history. Podcast 38A is an account of the Army's teaching Jerry the basic skills required of a soldier during the eight weeks of basic training in the early fall of 1966 at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Those skills included hand-to-hand fighting and bayonet assaults. Jerry's frustrations produce unique behaviors. It is recommended that you listen to the Army training stories in the order in which they are presented so that you can appreciate the full contextual richness of the later stories. Soldier Skills, Part A Marching and running in formation are highly valued skills for any soldier to have. Why else would we spend so much time at them? Every morning we had our jogging together. No matter how often we did it, there were stragglers. Wherever there were stragglers, there were sergeants, pulling other soldiers out of the line to grab a straggler. Stragglers could not be left behind. Everyone had his spot in the marching formation. My place was about in the middle, The biggest, strongest guy in the platoon was at the front. He carried the platoon's flag as well as whatever equipment the rest of us were carrying. Hawk's position was in the front third of our moving block of men. He had been a track star in college. There was no doubt that he was fast. A base record was almost broken when he ran the mile in the first PT test we took. He had the lean, hollow-cheeked look of a distance runner. His blonde hair and blue eyes made you think of the movie star Alan Ladd. The image Alan Ladd conveyed on the screen of the quiet but intense person with a good heart fit Hawk perfectly. People seemed to gravitate to him. You hardly noticed his small stature because his presence was so large. He was kind to everyone. I liked him, and so did a lot of other people. Two years was all he wanted to spend in the Army. He planned to serve his time and get out. The sergeants quickly paired Hawk up with a straggler. Jim was a patsy-skinned fellow who looked like he had never even walked hurriedly in his life. His pudgy frame spoke of a sedentary lifestyle. He seemed nice enough. Walking, jogging, and running were not a part of his repertoire. When Jim called out that he could not make it at some point during a run, Hawk and one or two other guys would grab Jim's arm and pull him. He would protest that he simply could not make it and ask them to please let him go. It was a scene that repeated itself like a badly scratched record. Jim would be pulled and pushed along until we finally got to wherever it was we were going. Many were the times when I was so tired and exhausted that I would consider dropping out. But if the others could keep going, so could I. Everyone had to be tired, but they kept going. I kept going. There was, however, no energy left in me to be pushing or pulling a straggler like Jim. Hawk had grit, and he was always so nice to everyone. 
One night, we were returning late to the barracks from a long march. All 250 or so of us were dog-tired. We had layers of sweat marks in our armpits. Some activities they had us doing that day would get us all sweated up, and then we would stop for more instruction. The sweat would sweat us up again. The next activity would get us sweating, and then we would stop again. The sweat rings just kept building. Anyway, as we were heading back to the barracks that night, Sergeant Soto ordered us to start double-timing. We groaned in unison. That really made him mad. He shouted at anyone he spotted talking in ranks, which meant that he was shouting all of the time. Sergeants Boone and Zarconi were jogging along beside our platoon, barking out orders to keep up, shut up, and stay in step. The weight of the field packs, half-empty canteens, and our weapons added to our misery. People kept tripping over unseen objects under their feet, which in turn broke their rhythm. The result was that you either stepped on the heels of the guy in front of you, or the guy behind you stepped on your heels. Both things often happened at the same time. The heaviness of your feet and weariness of your whole body dominated your thoughts. Keep going. Do not embarrass yourself. The others are doing it. They are as tired as you are. Just keep going, you tell yourself. Somehow, I managed to keep moving. Gaps began appearing in the ranks. Some of the men began falling behind. The dust from our feet clogged our noses. Coughing increased at a rapid rate. Breaking out of the trees, we could see our cluster of barracks in the distance. Just one more mile to go. Our goal was in sight. I felt relieved. I could make it. As we moved onto the level surface of a paved street, the double time got a little easier. We were all breathing heavily through our mouths. Everything we did was punctuated with coughing, and this run was no exception. My own coughs added to the chorus. Something was happening. It was dark, but I was able to see that something was going on three or four rows in front of me. Then suddenly, Jim cried out, I can't make it. I can't go on. Let me go. Let me go. Through the darkness and bobbing bodies, I could see Jim pulling back his hawk, and another guy tugged on Jim's arms. Damn! It made me mad. There they were, just as tired as I was, yet they had to pull this guy along so that he could stay with him. Meanwhile... Jim was planting his feet on the street just like a puppy whose owner is dragging him by his leash at an obedience class. Jim's cries of protest and Hawk's voice telling Jim that he could make it were just too much. I hunkered down into a semi-squatting position and ran between the two or three guys to my right without tripping them as they jogged forward. As soon as I was clear of them, I squirted up the side of the formation. I passed Sergeant Boone and darted into the moving mass right behind the struggling group. Grabbing Jim by the shoulder, I pushed him to the ground. Soldiers immediately began tripping over him. Some stepped on him and fell to the ground. As he went down, Hawk and the other guy turned to reach for Jim. The moving formation and their forward momentum kept them in place as I screamed at them to let them go and keep moving. They turned and did as they were told. It did not take long to reach the barracks. As we were being dismissed from the formation to go inside, my anger at Jim had changed to shame. I wanted to help people. At least that was what I thought. That was why I had chosen to become a school psychologist. So what is a helping person doing 
pushing a fellow down to be trampled on by a couple of hundred men in the middle of the night? As I was walking to the barrack doors, I came within hearing distance of Sergeant Boone and Zarconi. Did, did you see him zip out of the formation like that? Sergeant Zaccone laughingly asked. Yeah, where did he get the energy to move that fast? Boone replied. They both chuckled. Inside, Hawk approached me and asked, Why did you do that? It made me mad, Hawk. I said, you were exhausted. He couldn't go on. You couldn't have pulled him the rest of the way. It was time to stop. He has to start pulling his own weight. If he can't, then he can't. All the same, I'm sorry that I did it. Hawk told me it was all right. He said he knew that the situation could not continue as it had been. It was okay. The next morning at breakfast, I sought Jim out. He was seated alone, not talking to anyone. I sheepishly approached him. When he saw me, he smiled and motioned for me to sit down. Thanks for making them stop pulling me last night. I just couldn't go on. My feet were hurting me so badly, I just couldn't stand the pain anymore. I was stunned. After feeling so rotten for having pushed him to the ground, here he was thanking me. I sat down beside him and told him that I would try to help him and encourage him but that I would not drag him or let other people drag him in formation. He knew what he was capable of doing and the consequences of not keeping up. We all needed to value his decisions. I felt compassion for him. From then on, we were often together in various training situations. I liked him and felt sorry because his feet hurt so much. He never was able to keep up with us on the long marches or while double-timing. The sergeants gave him a lot of hell over it, too. Jim just accepted it and maintained his pleasant attitude with the guys. His limitations were an ever-present reality. We just kept on going. The instruction we received on throwing a hand grenade was helpful. You have to keep your body close to the ground and lob the grenade over your head. It then makes a nice high arc as it approaches the target. The trick is to hold on to it for a second or so after releasing the fuse lever before throwing it. That way it is likely to explode in the air just above the place for which you are aiming. An air burst has a larger killing zone than one that lands on the ground before detonating. The instructor coaching us in the art of tossing a hand grenade was really good. From that time on, I always got the highest scores on the hand grenade toss on the PT test. A guy in the company from Australia never was able to get the hang of it, though. Hawk explained... As kids, they just do not throw things over there like we did. This guy just could not master the technique of throwing it the way we were taught. They learned to throw the way we throw softballs. Their ball games did not have them throwing over the shoulder as we do in baseball or football, Hawk said. The sergeants would not let him throw it the way he wanted. This guy was doing well in all the other physical activities required of us. We were all understanding of his problem and sympathetic about it. It was news to me that an Australian could be drafted into the U.S. Army in the first place. He explained that one of the conditions of being allowed to enter the United States on a work visa was that you were eligible for the draft. He had been working in New York City for a couple of months when he got his draft notice. Rather than being mad about it, he saw it as an opportunity to get to know the country better. 
It also might help him get an extension to stay after he got out of the army, he speculated. Tossing a live grenade was more anxiety-provoking than I had thought it would be. A story was going around about a recruit in the grenade-tossing pit with one of the instructors. The guy had dropped his grenade right after pulling the pin. Once the pin is pulled, the only thing keeping the grenade from cooking off is the lever-like handle you keep pressed down in the palm of your hand. As soon as you release it, the chemical reaction inside the grenade's fuse starts. There is no stopping it. Four seconds later, the grenade explodes. Dropping a grenade after pulling the pin is not good. The story we heard was that the recruit panicked when he dropped a live grenade. While thrashing around and trying to get out of the pit, he kicked both the grenade and the sergeant several times. The sergeant finally grabbed hold of the kid and pushed him down to the bottom of the pit with one hand while picking up the grenade with his other and rolling over the top just as it went off. Neither one of them was hurt. Thank God for sergeants with cool heads. My turn came. It was no big deal until the grenade was in my hand. This was dangerous. I did not want to make a mistake. The sergeant was calm. He said everything would be all right. He would not let anything happen. Following his instructions, I pulled the pin and stretched my throwing arm back while reaching forward with the other. Then I flung the grenade in a high arc and we both ducked. The boom was not as loud as I thought it would be. Since we had both ducked before it exploded, I could not tell if it hit the target. The sergeant told me I had done a good job. That was the first and last time I threw a live grenade in training. Karate-like training was the key for hand-to-hand -hand combat. You stood sideways to your opponent, legs comfortably spread apart for balance, so you looked a little like a person in an ancient Egyptian wall painting. Extending your left arm straight out, parallel to the ground, you held your two lead fingers rigidly pointed at your enemy, with the other fingers curled into your palm. This way you could easily poke your counterpart in the eyes, nose, or throat. You kept your right hand above your extended left arm with its two lead fingers held rigid, but your elbow bent for the same basic purpose. Obviously, your attacker thought you were inching up on him in this exaggerated posture to poke his eyes out. That was just the time you needed to fool him by dropping both of your hands to cover your testicles while simultaneously swinging your right leg around to kick him in the testicles. It was a very clever move. The reason for protecting your testicles was a precautionary one. Just a split second before you decided to kick the other guy's groin, he might decide to kick yours. The first of the native New Jersey guys to sneak off post got a chance to use the move in real life. The story I heard goes like this. He went out to get a couple of beers at night and came back the next morning with both his eyes black and purple with a series of unique blends of the two colors that defied description. It seemed that he was very proud of his newly learned hand-to-hand -hand combat skills and had leaned on some dude at the bar. The two of them squared off. Just as our soldier switched from the finger-pointing move to cover his crotch with both hands and raise one leg off the ground to do in the villain, the villain punched him right between the eyes. 
He went down on the floor, out cold. Some of the high school buddies brought him back to the post. The guys said he was still a little groggy when he arrived. I had always thought that going absent without leave, A-W-O-L, was a real bad thing. In the movies, guys got shot for going A-W-O-L. At Fort Dix, several of the guys went AWOL on a frequent basis during the night. The four-lane highway was within the sight of the barracks. Just a mile or so down the road was the civilian world. It was a temptation. How these guys found the strength at the end of the day's training to slip out at night and drink was a mystery to me. The sergeants put you in a world of hurt in the morning if your boots were not shined and your belt buckle did not gleam from extensive rubbing with a special polishing compound and a can called Brasso. The only time we had to do that was at night, just before lights out. Of course, you also had to have your personal area perfect to pass morning inspection or you would find your stuff tossed all over creation when you got back from training. In addition to all of that, there were group work details to be accomplished, such as cleaning the latrine or polishing the floors. There was just a lot to do. Plus, there were things to study, like the chain of command from Sergeant Zarconi to President Johnson, in the military code of conduct. It was all I could do to get these things done. There was no way I could slip out until the wee hours just to drink. Lamar was reported one of the worst when it came to going AWOL. When he was not around, you noted it. He was such a dramatic physical specimen. He could do anything that required strength so much better than anyone else. We always looked for him. He would unerringly demonstrate what none of the rest of us could ever be able to accomplish. On top of that, he was joyously happy about doing whatever he was doing. You just wanted to share in that happiness by watching him. They kept us pretty much with our own platoon, so we did not see people from the other platoons except at a distance or while standing in line to practice some training activity. Our platoon had to strain to look over to Lamar's platoon during training, but strain we would just to see him perform. The story was that the sergeants would counsel Lamar but nothing ever happened to him. After a while, Lamar was just not around. No one knew what happened to him. The sergeants, of course, said nothing. At the beginning of the second week of training, the honey button truck started showing up wherever we were. We could have been marching way out in the woods for several hours, and suddenly the sergeants would announce that we had honey bun privileges. There would be a small truck with its side panels up, revealing candy bars, peanuts, honey buns, and the like. If we messed up on some training session, fell asleep in the bleachers, or talked too much while marching, we were threatened with the loss of our Honey bun privileges. I did not like honey buns. That did not matter. What mattered was being able to get a little treat that you usually were denied. Is the spirit of the bayonet in your heart? shouted the sergeant. Yes, we spring back in unison. Our vigorous reply pleased the sergeants conducting the training. We were full of smiles that we looked at each other. Hell no, 
The spirit of the bayonet was not in our hearts. You have got to be kidding, I thought. No one I knew in the crowd of trainees around me wanted to be in the Army in general, and none of us wanted to be in a bayonet fight in particular. It was a joke. The sergeants took our maniacal screams as a sign of our enthusiasm when we knew they were screams of frustration over this stupidity. I port! Horizontal butt stroke! Slash and stab! Ho! came the order. Twenty or so crude dummies hanging on posts were stretched out in a line in front of us. Standing about twenty yards from each dummy was a line of about twenty-five soldiers. On the command, High Port, the first man in each line pulled his bayonet fixed rifle across his chest. When the sergeant shouted, Ho! He ran toward the dummy while screaming wildly in chorus with the other charging grunts. As the men in the first rank came within a pace of the cross-like post with a straw-stuffed dummy tied to it, they tried to plant both feet squarely in front of the inanimate figure, not quite accomplishing the stance. They would swing the butt of their rifle toward the side of the dummy's head, then, pretending that their opponent was falling backward onto the ground, they brought down the bayonet's blade as if they were viciously slamming their fallen enemy across the chest. Having smashed the rifle butt into the imaginary foe's face, slashed him across the chest in the downward sweep of the rifle as he fell, they were standing naturally over the victim with the knife blade in a convenient position to neatly stab him. Exit imaginary enemy number one. High port, butt stroke, slash, and stab was a nifty ballet move for the Chinese opera. The problem was that a real-life enemy would not stand there waiting for you to do your little dance of death in front of him. It was not going to be like that in Vietnam. We all knew it. From the way we viewed the situation, bayonet drill was just another waste of time. What was important was getting back to the barracks and cleaning up the latrine so that we could get some free time on Sunday afternoon. At the very least, we would get the platoon bay's floor spit-shined or our shoes spit-shined and thus avoid having to do punishment push-ups. We had spent most of the day learning to execute various bayonet moves. The Army obviously thought they were important. We had already spent several training periods on them and no doubt would spend many more in the days to come. Properly executing the bayonet moves we learned was part of the proficiency test we would have to take at the end of basic. Each soldier would stand on a platform before a dummy. A sergeant would call out some bayonet drill, such as the butt stroke, slash, and stab. You would then assault the dummy and be graded on how well you carried out the attack. From there, you moved on to the next platform and waited for the sergeant at that station to issue another bayonet assault order. In all, you had to perform three successful bayonet attacks. If you failed the proficiency test, you had to repeat all or part of basic training. No one wanted to repeat basic training. It was just not all that much fun. The continuous criticism of our bayonet work was related to our apparent failure to be aggressive enough. We screamed and yelled as we ran up to the dummy but it never seemed to satisfy them. All I wanted was to be able to remember the moves well enough to pass the test. My wish pretty much reflected the desire of my associates as well. The sergeants told us that we could get a good score on the proficiency test simply by being aggressive. 
He said they were less concerned with the precision of which we executed the moves than they were with the degree of aggression we showed. One more afternoon of bayonet drill. This was getting old. We had gone through all of the maneuvers except one. When we finished learning this one, we could take a long break. Just standing in line gets old. My throat had been sore all day. I coughed a lot, and my damn big toe hurt. Moreover, we were never allowed to sit down while waiting in the line. The only time we were allowed to sit was during breaks. I was at the end of the line, joking around with some of the guys, when I suddenly had a great idea. The heat of the glaring sun coming from the cloudless sky probably brought it on. There were still about ten guys in front of me, so I had a long wait before it would be my turn. In the meantime, Hawk, Ben, Jim, and a few others of us had been laughing about funny scenes in movies we had seen. Watch this, I spontaneously said. This will be good for a laugh. Turning to the guys waiting patiently in front of me for their turn to do the new bayonet drill, I shouted, Make a hole! I'm coming through! Give me room! The spirit of the bayonet is in my heart! Pushing people aside, as I rushed to the head of the line, I screamed, I'm ready! I'm ready! Let me kill! I have to kill now! The spirit is in my heart! I tried to act as crazed as possible as I rushed to the front. No one resisted my advance. Puzzled looks whizzed in and out of my vision as I went forward. It was all I could do to keep from laughing. What a spectacle I must be! A soldier gone mad. It was truly funny. They were taking it all so seriously. At last I reached the front of the line. The men in the front rank were waiting for the sergeant to announce the bayonet move they were to execute along with the command to start. I'm sorry, I sputtered between growls and grunts to the guys at the head of my line. Let me go now. I have to go now. He nodded with widened eyes fixed upon me and stepped a pace or two back. Hunched down with my rifle at high port, I stomped my feet, snorted, growled, and grunted as if I were a Spanish bull in the fighting ring about to charge my rage of death upon the frail matador. Oh, how I wished I could have seen myself. It had to have been funny to the onlookers. I've got it! I've got it! I shouted. There was a mixture of hoarse throat coughing in my voice that accentuated the strangeness of the scene. It's in my heart. <coughs> the spirit of the bandit is there. I have to kill. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see the lead men in the other lines begin to turn and look at me, their mouths open. I port. Perry left, stab, withdraw, and charge. Ho! barked the sergeant. I lunged forward in a semi-bounding motion. My legs spread wide apart and made the most god-awful sound from deep within my chest that I could pull up into my throat and out of my mouth, moving as fast as I could in this exaggerated manner, caused my feet to scrape up a trailing cloud of dust. Again, my peripheral vision communicated to me the other Attackers had fallen behind, their attention riveted on my shenanigans rather than on their targets. This spurred me into even faster movements, accentuated with jerk screams and hops as the dummy moved into the center of my vision. 
swinging the rifle from high port to the assault stabbing position while at a fully animated din run was more than I had bargained for. I lost my grip on the upper portion of the rifle. The blade began falling to the ground. I fumbled to catch it as the momentum carried me forward. The blade caught the ground. The butt of the rifle punched me in the stomach. The rifle served as an impromptu pole vaulting to It lifted my feet off the ground as my chest crashed into the dummy. It vibrated as I wrapped my arms the dummy to keep from ricocheting off of it and falling on my back. Stunned and disoriented, I twisted and fought the dummy with my left hand while dragging my rifle up to my chest with my right. I fell back. At the last second, my feet stabilized on the ground saving me from falling over backward. Swinging the rifle up, I slammed it into the dummy, crashing, crashing my fingers. Oh, God! I crashed my fingers between the hard 4x4 pull in my rifle. The pain was instantaneous. Bouncing back from the impact put me into a crouching stance with my rifle at high port as I stared into the dummy's featureless face. Standing there, facing the dummy, I realized that I was surrounded with silence. The others had stopped their attack. Everyone was looking at me. I was in trouble. It was a joke but no one was laughing. All I wanted was to make a joke out of it and take an early break. This was not good. With my weapon still at high port, I slowly started walking toward the rest area. That's what I mean by being aggressive, men, the sergeant's voice boomed over the silent field. Let the spirit of the bayonet lead you. Good job, soldier. Turning to the lines of men yet to attack the dummies, he barked out orders for the next group to assault the dummies. When I reached the rest area, it struck me that the non-com thought I had been serious. I could not believe it. It was a joke. <laughs>